It's exciting to welcome to Casa the cosmic speaker, Eric Schmidt. Well, thank you, George. And uh, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, um, but I really, really have enjoyed working with you over these decades. And you've been right a lot of the time, which is why it's worth listening to George Gilder. So first, let me start with, because I worked with George for so long and because he wrote the telecosm piece, which anticipated a lot of this, um, I went to Xerox Park yesterday for an old time meeting. And I was interested in the structure of the Alto computer, which had two and a half, 2.5 megabits, megabytes of disk storage and 128K of DRAM. And I compared that to a brand new iPhone 14. And there are six orders of magnitude of disk storage and five orders of magnitude of DRAM. In other words, there are half a million Altos, roughly speaking, in your iPhone or Android phone equivalent over 50 years. How did that happen? And I think the answer is we built a system of innovation that I've benefited and everyone in the room has benefited, which is a really powerful system. And so one of the things to understand before we start complaining is that this system, which is a product of America, a product of free enterprise, is uniquely special by virtue of the impact that it's had. And you have it in your phone if you're confused. Um, and so <clears throat> the way that that system works is that the universities produce extraordinary research, graduate students, undergrad, uh, assistant professors, et cetera. We all understand that. The private sector provides a lot of at-risk capital, venture being an example, the others being others. Um, and finally, the government sets the rules and occasionally does pre-buys in the market, um, especially for things which are strategic for national security or, or pro-competitive in the view of the government. That union, the three different axes, is the secret. And so I'll give you an example. If you're a pure I hate government person, why would you agree that Operation Warp Speed was good? Because after all, what Warp Speed did is because of the national emergency of COVID, it pre-bought products from companies, whether they would work or not. And then if you think about it, a lot of the people who invested in COVID solutions lost billions of dollars. And lots of the research work in universities was, was fallacious, but there were a few that emerged. So the system produces excellence by precisely because of the nature of its competitive approach. So that's sort of comment number one. Comment number two, I'll, I'll sort of do three or four of these. Comment number two, is that AI is moving much faster than I think it is. And I think it's moving at the fastest pace I've ever seen. And I wanna give you an example. Um, most people understand AI as basically traditional training, um, labeled training data, that kind of stuff. That's what most people use AI for. The new development of large language models is very interesting because you basically use a technology called transformers you basically use this technology and then you basically get these systems which know things and you have to figure out what they know. They have lots of problems. They have bias. They have prejudice. They fail. You can they, they do something called hallucinating where you make a suggestion to them and then they believe it and then it's obviously false and then they continue that uh, propagation in their systems. So I thought, I thought that was sort of the end. But in the last couple of years, now people are using these things in very clever ways because the language models are really sequence predictors. That's what transformers really do in a technical way, which we can discuss. And the important thing about predicting sequences is a lot of life is sequences. So, for example, biology is sequences. So people are now using large language models to predict future proteins, proteins interaction, things like that. And it's only limited by the data. A more interesting example is uh, DeepMind recently announced that they had come up with some new algorithms around math and in particular multiplication, which they did using some very complicated reinforcement learning techniques. I'll give you another example. Um, I met with yesterday a fellow who worked at Google who had basically taken a large language model, an internal one, put a math front end in pre and basically fine, fine tuning. So now they have a math system that you can talk to 
And then they built a front end, which can serve as a tutor. Now this tutor is gonna be a better tutor than any other math tutor, except for personality. But presumably the personality can be added with another, another model. So the future for, for these AI systems is not one model, but a series of models that put things together. I was on a review this morning with a company, a small startup, which is trying to generate, it wants to be a question answering systems for a specific vertical. The most efficient way for them to train is to start with the data that they care about, have the computer generate the questions that you should ask, then use the questions to train a second model so it gets smart in case you ask a smart question, because then it up levels all the outcome, all the answers better. Now, this is an approach, it would never have occurred to me. It just never occurred to me to generate synthetic data for human question answer. But that's the that's the state of the art. And I can go on. The third comment I would make has to do with our national security. I spent lots of time and worked with the military for a very long time. And uh, it's time now for us to recognize that the technology that I'm describing, whether it's the system of innovation, these new systems that are AI based, need to be adopted by the government who are traditionally very bad. Why are they very bad? One, they don't have the best people. Two, they don't pay them. Three, they don't fire them. Four, there's no objective function in the company. And basically it's just easier to run a 1980s structure because everyone kind of knows it. There's no reason to reform it. And we can talk about that. But so in order to understand what would happen in a real war with tech people, I went to Ukraine. And what happens is that um, in Ukraine, the fellow who was the uh, Zelensky's campaign digital manager became his digital minister. And the digital ministers created an app called DIIA, DIA, which is in Ukraine language. And basically it does things like passports and things like that. So they added a helpful feature, which is you can take a picture of a tank. It does a, a classification of the tank, what kind of class it is using traditional image recognition. And it sends the geotagging of the tank to a separate group, which is a bunch of humans who make a targeting decision and blow up the tank. Um, more recently, they decided that they were going to take an approach to drones where they would take an army of drones and literally take the software out of the drones and rewrite it. So, for example, they took DJI drones and they modified some so they could look for uh, Russian soldiers in uniform and report back where they were. Now, seems like a pretty simple idea, incredibly powerful. So when you think about it for a while, everything we know about national security is wrong in the presence of autonomy and replication. So today we have one drone, these cost $20 million, they're called predators, for thousands of people. Instead, we should have 100 drones for each soldier or C person or whatever it is. And some of them should be observational and some of them should be uh, dangerous and they should be under the human's control. And they should also be self-autonomous and swarming and things like this. So all of a sudden, I'll give you another example. Why do we have these large ships? Because there's no place to hide and everyone knows where the ships are. It, did, it used to be we didn't know where the ships are, but now we know where all the ships are. And furthermore, we don't have very good attack uh, re resistance to hypersonic missiles because they're moving too fast. So we need fewer ships and more underwater drones. Now you need some ships, but you don't need as many as we have, but you need lots and lots of these drones because what you do is you put them under the water and they go and for example, in the Taiwan Strait, they create havoc. Think of them as having mini torpedoes to make a point. Think of them as mini submarines. My point here is we're just not conceiving our national security in the framework that we, that we conceive our commercial and, and academic operations. And that's important. And I want to finish which with, because uh, I don't want to talk too long, about my current hobby horse. So Kissinger, Dr. Kissinger and Dan Huttenlocker and I wrote a book about this, which was published last, uh, basically six months ago. And here is what we said. We said that this arrival of this information is much bigger than people think about it because We've never had another intelligence that's not human. We assume when we're dealing with some other person, even if we don't like them, that they're human, that they have biology, that they have to go to sleep, that they have a mother and a father, and maybe they have children, and maybe they're emotional and so forth and so on. 
but we're going to be operating in the next five or 10 years and forever in a world of many different kinds of intelligences that we depend on. So the thought experiment I would offer you is, what do you think happens in five or 10 years when your kid's best friend is a computer and is very helpful to them and very helpful to you, I might add, but it's non-human, right? What's that bonding look like? What's the socialization of that person? I'll give you another example. If I were an evil CEO of a social media company, and I'm not referring to anyone currently in charge of a social media company, so we're clear, um, I would do the following. I would take social media, I would amp it up using AI to generate um, anxiety. And the reason I would generate anxiety is anxiety in social networks travels three to seven times more than reason discourse for whatever human reason. And because my advertising system matters for uh, is measured based on engagement, that maximizes engagement. So are, are you surprised that we're all upset all the time? I'm not. It's social media's fault. And so we built a, a, a system where we thought we were just making people, you know, loose bindings and weak friends and so forth. But because of AI, we turned it into a form of terrorism. And a ter it's a form of terrorism against sort of proper thinking, culture, morals, truth, et cetera. And I'm not making a political comment. This is done by all the players. So we are in the process of doing an extraordinary human experience without any controls, without any test cases, without any, is this okay for teenage girls? Is this okay for teenage boys? What about old people? There are clear benefits to all of this. But it's no longer possible for me to sit as my normal techno optimist and say to you that these are unadulterated good. Because when, when the technology we build intersects with the reality of the human experience, it surprises us. And some of these surprises are very concerning to me. So on that not so cheery note, George, Thank you, Eric. Um, Peter Thiel spoke earlier at this conference and made the observation that you take it a typical AI uh, publication or discourse or, or defense or analysis, and you replace every entrance of the word AI with either the word software or computer and nothing really changes. That AI is, is not a transformative technology, it's just the next step in the advance of the computer technologies that you used to work at at Sun. I mean, it's, it's, and it's enabled by the advance of the semiconductor industry and um, Moore's Law, which continues to uh, work in various forms across uh, the industry. What, uh, and in your book, what struck me was you assumed that AI somehow had to be uh, opaque. Uh, it would be prevalent, opaque, uh, enigmatic, it, it somehow, uh, couldn't explain itself. But if it can't explain itself, it really doesn't function as uh, an accessory to human creativity and advance. So why can't you program AI so it can explain itself? If it can't do that, it certainly has serious limitations as a technology that can be launched into the world. Um, well, first, I have a great deal of respect for Peter Thiel, but I don't agree with your your version of what he said. So okay. we're clear. I believe that I believe that this is transformative at a much greater scale than and and, and, and I have the arguments to to make to prove it. You're describing what is known as the explainability problem, and we now know in these AI systems we can find out where the knowledge is stored 
and we can understand why it does something within reason, but we cannot do we cannot do so uniformly. So in other words, we just fundamentally don't know if you can use it 500 times and on the 501st time it'll do something wrong. And so one way to understand them is that these systems are today advisory, but you would not want to use it to fly an airplane no. because you can't take a chance of a one in 500 just sort of confusion. No. There are plenty of people working on this, but the models are getting so complicated and our understanding of what their knowledge is is so poor that I think it's going to be a while. And I'll give you an example. Um, people have tried to figure out how a computer recognizes a scene by analogizing it to the way humans recognize a scene. Yeah. But the evidence is that the computer is looking at different things than we are. It literally is weighting other things in ways that we don't fully understand. And if you look at these multi-stage algorithms that I was describing, yeah. take an example of AlphaGo, um, the creator of AlphaGo, which, uh, uh, excuse me, AlphaFold, which is Demis Hassabis. AlphaGo was the breakthrough in performing games. And um, <laughs> was, was it AlphaGo that beat Kasparov or was it... Uh, it won go, won go against Seadal in Korea, right? But That's correct. So uh, Kasparov was actually before. So what happened was AlphaGo beat the Korean and then the Chinese. No. Um, and AlphaGo was organized around self-play and self-teaching. So the before AlphaGo was turned off, it was trained with no rules. It just watched the game and figured out how to win. No. It took four days of training to go from being ignorant to being the best player in the entire world. That shows you the power. Now, games are um, relatively constrained. They have a clear objective function. They have a clear definition of winning, even though Go was very complicated. In, in the protein folding, where Google just recently released 200 million protein sequences, which is an extraordinary achievement, Demis said publicly, that there are two networks that interact with each other that produce this, we don't fully understand why they work. Mm. So what I would tell you about AI is that we're going to be deploying AI without fully understanding why. And if it makes you feel any better, you work every day with humans who can't explain their behavior either. That's right. So, <laughs> right. So, you know, and yet somehow it works. And your teenagers certainly cannot explain what they're doing. Trust me. No. So, Well, uh, that, uh, but uh, still, if it uh, it would be a great breakthrough to make AI that could understand AI, but it yeah. is we really do understand it. It's statistical pattern recognition is what's going on, and uh, the statistical uh, sim uh, embodied in symbol systems that we create, and. Uh, and if, if the symbol systems misrepresent reality, the AI is going to misrepresent reality. It's, I, I, I think the mystification of AI is a mistake. Uh, this idea that it's doing things that we really do understand what it's doing. We, we understand that it's, uh, for example, computing game outcomes uh, a billion times faster than humans can pr play the games. So uh, if they can iterate a billion times more, they can uh, play all the possible games or such a representative sample of possible games that, that uh, the conclusions they reach can defeat a human game player. But we understand these things. They aren't mysteries. They're the a manifestation of advances in Moore's law and computer mm -hmm. software that and uh, I just uh, why why all this concern with how it's going to baffle human beings and uh, confuse ch children play with smartphones they uh, drive cars they they deal with all kinds of technologies that hugely enhance their capabilities. 
Uh, right. So, so, but let me give you an example. Um, uh, somebody built an AI system that would tell stories. And so a mom decided to use it to tell a story to their five-year-old. Yeah. So of course, of course, the, the five-year-old got a story that was not appropriate for the five-year-old. <laughs> so we don't know how to constrain these. Let me give you another example. And I want to be clear what my view is. We tend to view AI as one thing, but in five to 10 years, we will be dealing with thousands of them. Yeah. So let's use an example of a physicist. Physics is so complicated, I've never understood any of it, but trust me, even the physicists complain. So what a physicist wants is it wants a physics assistant that reads all the papers and makes suggestions for the him or her to think about and then iterate based on what he or she is interested in and do more research. That is going to be happening in the next few years. Right. Um, the, the concept of having an equal assistant the, the man and machine teaming that we've talked about, that you've talked about in your books for a long time, is now upon us. Mm. And so imagine a situation where experts cannot do their jobs without a computer expert attached to them. That's the most likely scenario. Now, is that one expert? No. There'll be thousands of them. And furthermore, not, they're, not, they're not all going to be as good as the others. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe the U.S. will have a better one than the Chinese and will do better physics. Who knows? Or vice versa. What's your view of that issue? You've been scrutinizing the Chinese advances and their amazing production of millions of engineers and focusing on software rather than gender studies or something. And uh, what's, what's your sense of our ability to keep up with the Chinese in AI? We had Kai-Fu Lee speaking last, last year, and, uh, and uh, there's a lot of concern about China. What's your view on, on uh, that challenge or opportunity or menace? <laughs> so Kai-Fu and I know each other well. He worked for me for a decade. No. And he can be understood as an optimist about Chinese application of AI techniques to business and business and society. And that's sort of his view. And that he wrote a book about it. No. So and I generally agree with him. But let me give you some recent data. So I went to Singapore because I didn't want to go to China and I met with my Chinese friends. And these are Ch men who are Chinese nationalists, you know, the stereotype, short hair, you know, I'm a member of the party, I'm driving and so forth. Yeah. And they're very smart and quite ruthless as business people. So they're impressive people. All they wanted to do is complain to me about President Xi in China. And it, and it turns out something happened six or seven months ago involving when they started, for example, banning Ch uh, English language training and things like that within the country, where the people who are my friends realized that she is not a capitalist. He's a Marxist Leninist. Mm. And like, oh, my God. And so now this category of people who are impossibly valuable and impossibly smart to Chinese as a country. Yeah are now seriously trying to figure out how do I get myself and my family out of it. Now, this is not to say that there's not another generation of people right below them, but they'll encounter the same thing. So the one way to understand the China problem is first, um, let me say it correctly, in the rest of my lifetime, the tensions between China and her growth and the West and its growth are going to be the defining one. It won't be Russia, as much because Russia is much easier, China is much harder. Second, we're going to be integrated with China, whether we like it or not. We're not going to decouple the boring stuff, which is the majority of it. We're going to buy steel and parts and furniture yeah. and so forth and paint. For certain areas, we're going to have huge fights. And those areas will involve AI, quantum, uh, uh, basically forms of new energy, synthetic biology, certain kinds of transformation, and a couple of other things, including re uh, face recognition and tracking. If you take a look and you score how they're doing versus we are, they are dominant in financial services, uh, surveillance, and new energy, and probably in autonomous cars, and all, certainly in 5G, where we lost that big time. The, the U.S. is, at the moment, still leading in these other areas. How do I know what the list is? 
China published their list <laughs> two years ago. And it, when I did the AI commission, we actually published our list, which turned out to be very similar to their list. Mm. And the White House recently published another version of the same list. It's all the same things. So we understand where the engagement is. So one way to think about it is that we're not at war with China, but we're in a competition, rivalry, cooperative framework where the stakes are really high. Mm. The scale, for example, of the synthetic biology revolution is trillions of dollars of new wealth. I'd like that wealth to be in the West and in particular in the United States and especially in the Republican red states where a lot of the feedstock is, right? That seems like a good outcome for America. So we need to get ourselves organized to make that happen. So, um, if uh, our response however isn't so enlightened in my view as your ex your your view and your proposal uh, our current response is trying to deprive china of access to critical semiconductor technologies uh, the for and to have a kind of poultice of subsidies that supposedly will compensate for loss of half of the world's semiconductor market uh, with, and, and uh, pushing, I gather already, semiconductor capital equipment companies in uh, China are already growing five times faster than semiconductor capital equipment companies in the United States. In other words, most of our sort of adversarial efforts to inhibit uh, Chinese progress are in fact both uh, failing to inhibit it, they actually spur Chinese progress, but in directions that do not uh, cooperate or collaborate or, or uh, use US standards and protocols and architectures, they, we're, we're really trying to drive them, to vindicate Xi's Marxist-Leninism. Now, this may be a, a really effective way to <laughs> destroy China, but it's, uh, it, in this process, I fear that it will destroy American technological leadership. It's, do you have any uh, comments on that? Yeah. I don't I don't completely agree with the way you described it, okay. because um, as long as the restrictions are very specific and as long as they have a national security purpose, I'm OK with them. So let's consider ASML, which is the sole source manufacturer of the technology required to do ultra EV, which is basically five nanometers yeah, and below. Right. And for the audience's benefit, a smaller number is better. And one nanometer is roughly the size of an atom. So or basically the space between atoms. So to give you a sense of how small these things are, it's indescribable how much stuff there is. So let's consider and you want to use the frame of a race, right? There's a race between the U.S. and China on A, B, C and D. We lost 5G. I don't think we can, for all sorts of reasons, I don't think we can hold them back on software because software is too diffuse, it leaks, it's too easy for them to steal it and so forth. The Trump administration followed by the Biden administration targeted semiconductors because they're so important to both national security and economic growth. And so China's response, which is called dual circulation and made in China 2025, is to put more and more money into companies like SMIC, S-M-I-C, which is the one that does their own chips. Yeah. Now, they already build the majority of the world's packaging. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the logic. And so somebody discovered about two months ago that China had stolen from TSMC, which is a Taiwanese company, the recipe for a five nanometer chip. And subsequent to that, SMIC announced it was doing Five, sorry, seven nanometers. It announced it was doing five nanometers in the process that's available to them. We have announced on the West that we're going to go from five to four to two. Now, is the difference in two nanometers versus five nanometers a big difference? In most cases, it's not. 
but it's it's a, it's a serious difference, but it's not a, a, a disabling difference. So that shows you that even with all of the sanctions and the restrictions, it's very hard to hold the, the Chinese back because they're so good at what they do. It's a different model. I don't I'm not endorsing it. I don't want to work there. I think it's a bad place in all sorts of ways. But the fact of the matter is we need to take them seriously. It's a different but effective system. And we need to be aware of it. I'm not as worried about other countries because their systems are not as is not a, not as effective. Well, if we um, mimic them, uh, you know, they've been mimicking us. So even with their supposed Marxist-Leninist she, I agree that he's uh, bad news. Uh, but uh, even with that, they have um, more venture capital being dispersed. They got uh, many more engineers, um, millions more engineers. They got, uh, they're, they're really in a strong position because they mimicked us, because they uh, have an extraordinarily intensely competitive entrepreneurial economy. They, while actually in practice today, their government spending, such as it is, and it's hard to define it, but, but the estimates are that it's maybe half as much government spending as a proportion of their GDP as we have. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried that, that we have this idea that we're faced with this conventional Marxist-Leninist adversary and uh, and we mimic him by having uh, big chip, new chip acts, and essentially um, uh, kind of having uh, the administrative state take over our technology. And that's what I I worry worry about. Well, the, uh, the good news the good news for us about China is China has other problems. It appears as they hit peak population, their demographics are terrible. Their growth rate is down to somewhere between one and two percent, depending on whom you believe, which is not enough to keep things going well. No. So I think China is going to have trouble politically and have trouble in terms of economic growth. And the way they're going to solve that is by doubling down on technology as it makes them more productive. Yeah. So the reason I'm focused on China is that my argument is true whether they're doing great or doing poorly. They're smart enough and they have enough money and enough people and enough talent and enough PhDs to do this. The solution for the United States is to take that, that model, that innovation model I described, the government yep. and universities and private capital and double down on it, make it bigger and also work with like-minded partners. Yep. Think about Japan, think about Australia, think about India, think about some of the larger European countries. Yep. The little countries don't matter because you need lots of people to pull these things off, but the big ones can be strong allies for us in terms of the Western growth. Israel has been pretty critical to Google and Microsoft and Intel and uh, Arc, and is a small country. I've, I've, small countries like Singapore uh, can uh, can make vast uh, vast contributions as you. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. And, and the, the reason I was mentioning it is that if you look at the scale of these industries, as as much as I like Israel and Sing Singapore, they just don't have enough people to build these platforms on their own. And you'll notice that they're incredibly intertwined with countries uh, with larger groups. Sometimes the Israelis are in charge, sometimes they're partners, and they're very, very good. Yeah. Well, that... Uh I mean, AI should be, should multiply. I mean, the history of of technological advance has always been spearheaded by a few amazing geniuses who've transformed one field after another. And uh, these AI tools that you describe in such compelling way in your book. Uh, are uh, surely magnify the capabilities of small countries uh, rather than uh, render them less effective. I, 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 I doubt the theory that uh, new technologies are 
requiring more and more centralization and uh, large entities. Uh, I wrote Life After Google, after all. And, uh, how is it, Life After Google, uh, Eric? <laughs> Well, for me, I was at Google for 19 years. I'm very proud of my service to Google and to the world. Yeah. Um, but the stuff I'm working on now is even more compelling. Uh, what I've been doing is focusing on synthetic biology and AI and quantum. Ah. I want America to win, and I want us to have the right strategies at the state of the art. We have the money and the talent and the people. What happens in America is that we're all so upset about everything now that we bitch all day. But the fact of the matter is that America is a fantastic country for innovation and we need more innovators. You have spent a lot of time, I think your whole career, talking about the importance of entrepreneurship. We need more, we need more education, we need more incentives, we need more training, we need more, uh, we need more teachers of it, yeah. we need more, more of everything. Yeah. And the good news, there is good news here, and the good news is that if you look at computer science, when I was a computer scientist, it didn't exist. So now, 45 years later, computer science is the number one major in all of the leading U.S. universities. Yeah. And so, for example, in MIT, which is not a normal place, 70% of all of the undergraduates take a machine learning course. That has to be good. Yeah, that yeah. means you're going to have a whole workforce of 20-somethings yeah. who are capable of using these tools for effect. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's exciting. So, so what uh, what are you doing in synthetic biology? I mean, we uh, we heard earlier presentation that casts some aspersions on the success of AlphaFold. That uh, the AlphaFold people couldn't really say how their uh, increasing success in producing three-dimensional proteins could translate into actual medical advances or whatever. Can you, it might be worth it for you to refute that. I, I bet you yeah. can. I, I think it's just, it's just another sort of falsehood. People obviously don't know the numbers. There are something like 600,000 users of the protein folding results right now. How many? And 600,000 users. 600,000 users yeah. of protein. That's, and are they, those, how many are in the United States? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you that because I'm doing a lot of funding in biology yeah. and because I have a special interest in this, I've been asking them. And everyone I know is beginning to use uh, the, some version of either the David Baker lab re result, which is out of, out of University of Washington, which is very impressive, or AlphaFold as part of their uh, guesstimation of how proteins work. So they'll literally, they used to have to sort of guess and now they can use the computer to predict. Yeah. Synthetic biology, uh, so we did a report about six months ago, we being my foundation, and we did it in conjunction with the White House, so it had some imprimatur of reality um, in science. And basically what it said is the following. The synthetic biology people believe that 60% of or more of what we build today can be grown. Yeah. And the way they get there is they think that kind of anything that has, I don't know, carbon in it can be grown. So, for example, any kind of liquid, any kind of fuel, uh, steel, concrete, bricks, plastics, in their view, can be done. Now, a lot of these things are not price competitive, but they are tech, they are competitive in terms of their structure. Yeah. And the benefit of these, in addition to being innovative and um, US made, is that they are, uh, they don't use carbon in the same way. So they're pro environment, which is always good. But the, to me, the most important thing was the food that these things use to grow is from feedstocks. And where are feedstocks? Feedstocks are the, the, what's left over after you till the farm, if you will. <laughs> and you know this as well. And where are those feedstocks? The rural states. Every rural state has, an, has a, a land-grant university mm. with, an, with a very good agriculture department because that's what they were founded for. Every one of them is an opportunity 
to run experiments in every state as to how do you take the economics of that state and make it more competitive. To me, that is a huge agenda because the scale, it, it, many of, if you look at the math in America, the majority of the intellectual growth and the economic growth is occurring in the blue states on the coast. We've, we've like ignored the, the, heart, the middle land, middle land in one reason or another because of the loss of manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Here is a way to build very high paying jobs that are in the heartland that are really strategic and everyone will like. Yeah. That's I, why we should invest in it. Yeah. And, I, and if, you don't, if you don't like what I just said, uh, imagine that China is also, even if I'm completely wrong about my motivations, China has exactly the same list and they want to do it because they want to dominate it globally. We need to win. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Eric. That was a t- tremendous performance. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, George. Thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you soon. And I, I've, you've influenced my work over so many decades. If there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. Thank you so much, Eric. Really appreciate it.